everybody. I'm Kelly Hogan. I'm very excited today to be joined by Dr. Ben Bickman, and I do have his permission to call him Ben today. <laughs> I am very excited to talk to him. I've watched a lot of your videos. I've shared a lot of your videos. There are so many. There's there are too so many. many. <laughs> no, it's great. There was one with Dr. Lat Mansour. Uh -huh. Recently, it was on his channel, and oh man, it got me really fired up. And that's when I was just sitting and typing questions. And as soon as it was over, that's when I emailed you and said, "Would you be willing to come and talk?" And you said, "Yes." I've Are been waiting. I've oh, just been. Goodness. I've been sitting over here in the corner at the dance, wondering when someone's going to come take me for a spin. Let's do this. Oh, you've got a wonderful brand. Yeah, very much. I've long admired what you're doing, and I'm delighted to share any insight I can to be helpful to anyone. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. If anybody has listened to either one of us talk lately, then they know we have each been passionate about talking about insulin and the amount of fasting insulin in a person's body and how can it can affect every cell in our body. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to link to some of your videos and mine if people want to dig in. But just for somebody who is showing up out of nowhere here, why should they care what their fasting insulin score is or about trying to bring it down? Well, you, you teed this up really well. Insulin is a hormone that affects uh, literally every cell of the body. The thematic effect of insulin, if we can try to uh, narrow down its scope to one, crystallize it to one idea, we would say that insulin's primary effect is to regulate nutrient metabolism. And this is certainly of all the drums I beat in my career as a scientist, um, the drum that I beat the loudest is that we need to know what our insulin levels are, because if we don't, we don't really know what our insulin resistance state is. And, and that matters because most people don't know they are insulin resistant. And it is the single most common health disorder in the world. I call this coin that I'm holding insulin resistance. And on one side, it is the phenomenon wherein some cells aren't responding particularly well to insulin. But I said some cells, not all cells, but some of the body cells aren't responding very well to insulin. That's the insulin resistance part of it. But we flip the coin over and there's the hyperinsulinemia part of it. The reason I beat that drum and you beat it with me, measure your insulin because that's a part of insulin resistance and it's a part that you can measure. You can't go into uh, to your doctor's office and say, hey, I need you to explicitly measure the degree to which insulin is uh, is able to enact its signaling at, at cells of my body. You, I can do that in my lab, um, but that's a purely academic thing. Uh, you don't do that in the clinic. It doesn't work that way. Um, so you have to pick up that coin and say, okay, I can't measure the insulin resistance part of it, but because I just want to know what the coin, how big the coin is, if you will, we'll measure. We'll look at the other side, which is get your insulin measured. Right. So I just had mine checked for. I think the third time i didn't even know i didn't know until a few years ago that we should even be checking fasting it's like my doctor never once no. mentioned it and a lot of my coaching group members when they ask their doctors for it their doctors will say there is no need for that i know it's that's because wild. yeah conventional clinical care looks at insulin as purely through a, a glucose centric lens they cannot separate the fact that insulin is not the same as glucose, glucose is not the same as insulin. Right. And I have, in a, in a one time, I give a lot of talks to um, clinician groups and including CME talks where it's a continuing medical education talk. Okay. So I'll be invited by a group to give a talk about insulin resistance to a room full of clinicians because they need to get a certain number of education credits for the year. And I had this like bizarre circular conversation one time in the Q&A where a physician said, well, Ben, why do we need to measure insulin? We can just look at the glucose. And, I, and I'd have to say, well, no, they're not the same. And he, well, I know they're not the same, but if glucose is normal, insulin is normal. And I said, no, I just got done talking to you guys about the fact that in insulin resistance, insulin is elevated, but the glucose can be normal, yes. which is why it's so insidious and why it's so overlooked. It's because, again, conventional clinical care only looks at the glucose. It's a glucose centric paradigm. And again, as part of this, um, you know, anthem that I'm calling out, it's we have to shift the focus because insulin can be elevated decades before the glucose starts to climb. Yeah, it's like 
saying, wow, your fire of glucose is so well controlled. So we don't even need to know how much water right. it's taking to spray to put it out. And you're like, oh, perfect. Months. Yep, it's yep, well said. Five fire trucks a day. All right. Okay. One of my greatest frustrations, Ben, is I work with a lot of very dear, fantastical carnivore women many of which are over age 50. Mm -hmm. Many of them have been eating nothing but animal products for at least several months, some for a couple of years. And so they've done the biggest thing that I think you and I would both say to reduce the amount of water, the amount of insulin being sprayed at this fire is reduce the fire. Reduce. Mm -hmm. the Take out the fuel. There you go. Reduce your carbs. They've done that. They're gone. And things start to improve. I mean, you know, a lot of them are off of blood pressure medications. A lot of them are no longer on metformin. They're feeling better. But some of them still are struggling to lose any weight at all. And they feel like, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. <sighs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So so I, I, I'm to my... I, I respect what you do, Kelly, for the record and for everyone can hears, um, hearing can know. I can't imagine being a coach. Um, just for the record, I worked as a personal trainer at a gym. I was certified during my master's degree and hated it. I hated that direct communication um, in that sense. Not, not to not to have anyone be discouraged and ever talking to me. No, not at all. Come talk to me. But right. I'm the kind of guy who wants to put fuel in the tank and I'm happy to let Kelly drive. You okay. know, like I want someone else to be where the rubber meets the road. So, so I have a lot of respect for what you do. It is very, very difficult for me to imagine an, a, a reason whereby in a person they would not be losing weight on a carnivore diet. That to me, it, it, it seems impossible. Same, um, because that's it, not how it went for me at all. Yeah. So it's like, why? why? And, and I've, I've never met someone uh, in, in all of my ex experience, I've never met someone who has not lost weight. Um, so there is a part of me that would, as a scientist, I would need to know exactly what's going on. And I'm not making any kinds of accusations here. You know these people yeah. and trust them. But I would I, I would have to know for certain that this person truly is only eating what they're saying they're eating. It, because I know that people are, are occasionally good self-deceivers. Um, but uh, let's, let's just imagine, let's create a situation in which the person were 100% not deviating from a carnivore diet. The only thing I can think of, it would be that this is a person who has uh, pre-diabetes or type two diabetes. So they are getting a sufficient insulin spike from the protein that they're eating from the meat, which doesn't happen in um, pretty much anyone unless you're a diabetic uh, for some reasons due to, due to some glucagon action. Um, so she's getting, the person's getting a sufficient insulin spike to defend the fat tissue and they're getting sufficient calories to fuel that fat maintenance. Uh, so this is my tangent that as much as people want to try to lock me into this little pigeonhole of saying Bickman says obesity and fat regulation is purely an endocrine effect, that it's purely insulin. Well, it's not. I mean, you of course have to have calories there. Yeah. But in the absence of the insulin stimulus, Fat cells can be swimming in a sea of calories and be shrinking like gangbusters. They will not know what to do with the fat they have. This is thematic of insulin's effect. Insulin tells cells what to do with the energy that they have. This is why an untreated type 1 diabetic, or even more insidious, a diabetic who's learned the fattening power of her insulin, just in, the, in a young teenage girl, imagine this temptation. She has learned that she can eat whatever she wants and as long as she underdoses her insulin, she'll be as skinny as she wants. It's because if insulin, in the absence of insulin, fat cells cannot stick, stay, they cannot stay big. Right. They must shrink. And now there are laws of thermodynamics. I'm not stupid enough to try to revoke them. But when people try to apply the laws of thermodynamics to the open system of the human body, they are messing with a very, very complicated equation. Because when insulin is low, metabolic rate starts to climb. We just start wasting more energy. Maybe they're eating meat that is just too high in protein. And I don't say that kind of thing too often. I'm a great defender of protein. 
Although I do think there are people, there are characters now in the social media space who are going way too far with it, um, with with promoting protein over everything else, vilifying yeah. fat. That is not right. Um, that is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but that's a tangent we can revisit if we'd like. But my only sentiment there, again, just to try if there can be any kind of insight for this person or these people who are frustrated by this, uh, maybe they would need to control their their protein um, and see what happens. Um, confirm that their insulin is low. Um, you know, and if they can't get into a doctor to actually do an insulin test and get a ketone meter, uh, and I'm not, I don't ever mean to seem like I'm a, uh, I'm a promoter, an advocate of ketones. I, I'm not, or a ketogenic diet, but I am a great defender because there's so much nonsense when it comes to ketones out there. And I know enough about them having um, explicitly studied them in my lab. But, but if, if this is a person who eats a pure carnivore meal or 24 hours of it, or 36 hours, gets to 48 hours, and their ketones aren't at around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, there's there's something wrong. Okay. Um, that's a body that is either releasing insulin in the background because they have an insulin secreting tumor, an insulinoma, or the amount of the amount of protein in their meat is spiking their insulin too much. And that has been shown to happen in diabetics because what will not spike your insulin is the fat. Yes. I have never seen any report in any human study to show, I mean, literally none in contrast to some people with a protein bump, yep. um, especially if they're diabetic, type two diabetic. Um, and some people might not know they are. And of course, nothing compared to um, pure carbohydrate. Yes. I have found that some of these women, if instead of having just big meals of leaner protein, if they will have a few smaller meals of meat, five ounces of meat with plenty of fat on it, even yeah. fat trimmings on the side yep. or butter on the side, that yep. they do start to see that number come down. Yep. Um, yep. It, I, I think that people need to be very, very careful. There are very, very compelling seductive voices now. I think promoting a view that I do not believe is healthy, which is protein at all costs. Yeah. It's protein and everything else is just waste. Equating carbohydrates with fat. Uh, yeah. th that to me is is laughably unscientific and and at the worst it's it's tragic because of how it might lead people to eat. Yes, I've been doing very high fat carnivore now since July, with even lots of days where I would do pure fat, what we would call mm -hmm. a fat fast, yeah. only fat. And because I am going to the gym, you can probably tell I CrossFit now, but because oh no. Here she goes. How do you know a CrossFitter? It's like, how do you know a vegan? They'll tell you. Well, I can't do this <laughs> whole app like interview without saying it. So yeah. yeah. But guess what? Muscle is growing. And I'm not just sitting here relying on protein to do it for me. I'm working muscles while eating adequate calories. And a lot of it is fat. Yeah. Well, if you hope to grow muscle, you'd better be getting a lot of calories because yes. the, the body will not commit to growing muscle lightly. It is a very energetically uh, expensive process. Mm -hmm. But what's so, even there, even there, the temptation is that we look at the muscle and we just say more protein being synthesized in the muscle will help the muscle grow. That's true. Of course, you have to have the stimulus to make it grow, yeah. which you're doing. Um, and anyone else who's exercising to, you know, some kind of fatigue is doing. So the protein, the amino acids are what's providing, is what's providing the volume of the kind of expansion, of course, yes. water and other things too. But then what's happening is my fingers are pulling further and further apart. These fingers, the shell, the membrane isn't made of protein. I mean, there are proteins in it. It's fat. Yeah. It's made of fat. And so if you hope to be expanding your muscles or even making your bone cells stronger, right. uh, you need fat on the membranes of these. And, and I believe that is why in nature, um, you, know, you know, I'm going to say it the way I want to say it. God put fat and protein together. It's supposed to come together in our hubris. We've and, and our misplaced fear of fat. We've pulled them apart, thinking, "Oh, fat is waste. Fat was never supposed to be in that meat in the first place, or in that milk." So I'm taking it out. <laughs> Who do you think you are, boy? It's there for a reason. Keep it there, and it's no coincidence that when we eat fat and protein together, we digest it much, much better. 
yeah. people uh, people don't appreciate this, but bile acids, which are released when we have fat coming down the line, uh -huh. when fat is coming down, the gallbladder will release bile acids. And bile acids, yes, will help digest fat, but they also enhance the proteolytic actions of the enzymes that are breaking down the protein. So we do not digest protein as well if we just take protein alone. Protein is supposed to come with fat. That's how we should eat it. Our bodies are literally built to get it that way. It's almost like there was a divine design here. It's um, weird, that, right? Yeah. So weird. That's great. All right, you mentioned ketones. Um, I feel like there's two schools of thought. One is... Oh my gosh, being in ketosis is like everything. We got to make sure we're in ketosis. So many benefits. And I assure you, I've, I have listened to you talk about so many of them. And, mm -hmm. and there are a lot. A lot of benefits. Mental, physical, just mm, got to love ketosis. Yeah. And then the other school of thought is do not chase ketones. Put away the ketone meters. You don't need to know. In fact, some people even say, if you've been carnivore for a while, you probably won't even show ketones above 0.5 on a meter. And I'm, I find that confusing because I've eaten nothing but meat for 13 years and I eat a lot. Um, and my ketones every morning, I don't check every day, but a lot of days, two mm -hmm. to four. That's just mm -hmm. where I fall, not 0.2, two mm -hmm. to four. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the ketone meters and ketones in general? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I, I you've framed this well. I, I do not want to, as much as I have talked about them, and I have, and I study them, I've published manuscripts. We have more manuscripts coming, including one that we're just about to um, publish with regards to brain mitochondrial function and ketones, mm. which has become an area that I've leaned into because of one of my PhD students, Erin. She, she was really interested, so we devoted time to study this and have published some wonderful papers. So I am familiar with ketones, and I defend them because there's so much insanity surrounding it. Yeah. Um, the, the the idea of ketones in the body. Um, but I also am not the kind of person who likes being obsessive. And I tend to promote that a little bit on others. Now, uh, in other words, I'm, what do I mean by that? I, I don't, I think there is diminishing returns when it comes to measuring ketones to invoke some concepts of economics. I think that when we, when you're first doing this, Ketones are proof positive to you that you're actually doing it. Because as I said, people are great self-deceivers. We sometimes don't even know. We don't even want to acknowledge what we're doing and, and then we'll, so that we can sort of be surprised when we're not finding the results we expect. And so if someone is saying, um, to, even to themselves, I'm doing this, I'm going to get all in. The ketogenic diet, or, or you know, a carnivore version of it even, is to my knowledge, the only diet that can be objectively quantified with regards to its adherence. Because you can measure your ketones and you can know I'm adhering to the diet or I'm not. Um, so that to me has value, especially if a person's kind of learning the ropes of it all. Uh, maybe, maybe learning that they're eating just way too much pure protein, uh, too much chicken, and they need a better, much more, I would say not a better source of meat, but a much more nutritious in every possible way, any kind of ruminant meat, which has more fat in it. Maybe they find they've got to do that. Maybe even put a little butter on that to um, and eat a little less of the meat overall, whatever it may be. Um, but that still nevertheless becomes a way for them to course correct. Because if you're on a carnivore, if you're eating zero carb and you don't find that you're consistently demonstrably in ketosis, something is wrong. Um, there really is something wrong there. Uh, within the body, there's there's something that's it's kind of gummed up the gears that you've got to find out what it is. Or, or in your habits, it's something internal or still something you're doing that you've not acknowledged or you just are totally unaware of. Um, like eating you know, chicken, I, for example, if you are a kind of a hyper responder to the protein, for example. Um, so to, to me, again, uh, measuring ketones has is helpful initially but then once you've been doing it for a while you know it's working then i think there is this diminishing returns where the the value of it isn't nearly as much as it used to be yeah i agree for while i was doing it every day because they sent me a meter they sent me the strips and it was like oh this is fun well day after day after day you're like okay yep. yeah 
Still yeah. in ketosis. Hold on, yeah, let me that's drink right. again yeah. tomorrow. Still yeah, in no, but but let me one other thought though, as you you kind of teed up this question. Um, it's not uncommon for people in their first um fit stage, first sort of weeks to months, perhaps, of of adopting a very low or zero carb diet for their ketones to be here and then over time to come down to here. And that's simply, you know, whereas before it was absolutely yes. zero. Um, that's because there is this mismatch where when you, uh, it is a waste. Um, when you have ketones that are being excreted in the breath and in the urine, you are wasting energy. And, and the, you know, that is not something the body is, is I'm, this sounds a little silly, but it's not something the body enjoys doing. Okay. Um, it, it's wasting energy. That, that is wasteful. Uh, and the body wants to make sure it has enough energy to survive. And so it, it's it's uh, what starts to happen is the body will start to utilize ketones better and better and better. And that's part of this adjustment of enhancing the population of mitochondria that people have. And ketones do, on their own, stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis. Ketones want to be burned. And so it's no surprise that, for example, they go to the muscle cells or the nerves and stimulate the synthesis of the powerhouses within the cell to enable the ketones to be burned better. And so this period of time where the person's in maybe a deeper state of ketosis, they're peeing out a lot of ketones. Um, and, and that's uh, a metabolic advantage at that stage because that means they're just wasting a lot of energy from their fat cells, you know, to be really precise about it. Um, but eventually the body becomes a little more miserly with the energy that it has. And so it starts to use the ketones a little better and, and quits wasting them. Um, but the person still should be in demonstrable ketosis. No question. If a person's eating zero carb, the if, if they weren't, you know, at like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, then there, there is something wrong. I mean, at a minimum, I would think they'd be higher to where you are. Um, even, even if they've been doing this for years, if a person finds that they truly are eating zero carb and they're barely registering in ketosis, something's not right. Yeah. Okay. I typically talk to my group members about things they could do that with time, it may not happen immediately because I've heard you say it can take, well, it definitely takes longer to bring down fasting insulin than it does your glucose. Glucose will mm -hmm. change, you know, in a few hours, yep. insulin can take longer. All right. So if they're avoiding carbohydrates, I think taking good walks, especially I'm really pushing this whole digestive walk right after you eat a meal. That's perfect time. Oh. Awesome. I'm loving it. I've got some people who are having good results with that. Resistance training, I think always a good idea. Trying to deal with stress, avoiding seed oils, getting good sleep, sunshine. When it comes to just weight loss and the idea of getting down fasting insulin, circulating insulin, is there anything else you can think of that you have seen be helpful or that you would recommend? Gosh, Is that a pretty that, good starting that, place? Yeah, you really, you really nailed them. Um, I, uh, in, in fact, I can't, I can't think of anything you didn't say. I, I often come to sleep. I point to sleep as one that a lot of people more and more are waking up to, um, yes. because it is so relevant. Um, but I, uh, it, it, the metabolic consequences really are um, uh, heavy. Where w one, one bad night of sleep will increase insulin resistance by over 25% the next day. I mean, a demonstrable um, a de demonstrable increase. As a scientist and educator, I am only on the, the knowledge side. I have the great um, fortune of just being able to sit back, look out the window, and think of good things to say that are smart sounding, but validated and valuable, and then leave it up to the person to actually put it into practice. That's, of course, where you are, where I have genuine respect for people who are trying to take information like I'm willing very readily to give out and then say, I know how I can fit this into something that I can actually help people with. I just want to let everybody know that as much as these ideas, the ideas are simple. Control carbohydrates, prioritize protein, don't fear fat, frequently fast. The ideas are simple, but the implementation of them is not for the vast majority of people because when we start talking about changing habits, habits we're talking about addictions um, very, very often. That is not easy to change. So I have nothing but respect for everyone who's on this journey and I'm on my own journey as well. When you say frequently fast, I plan on talking about fasting, but I do work with some people who love water fasting. 
Mm-hmm. They feel good. They get good results. They lose weight. And then there are some people who are a little bit more like me. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm the same way. I'm not a good faster. Now I can do, there are some things I can do. Um, a fat fast. Mm-hmm. I get, man, my glucose is down. My ketones are up. Energy. I feel like a million bucks euphoric yep. eating fat. But if you make me eat nothing at all, I I just hate life. Yeah. Oh, no, I hear you. Um, yeah, I hear you. So for my own personal use, there are three fasts that pop up in my life. Okay. Um, one is a fast, which is a part of my religion, where it's a 24-hour food and water fast. Oh. And when we what we do from that is the money that we save from not eating, we donate. So it's something like a fast offering, like an offering, like, you know, you'd find kind of in the old Testament. Um, so that's nothing. And those are, I, I do not feel good. I, 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 you know, you start to feel kind of fine, but the absence of the water, that's, that's a, that's a kick in the pants. That is really, really tough. So when I'm doing a fast just for health sake, I will commonly do hot, hot water with a pad of butter and electrolytes, flavored okay. electrolytes. I just did one of those, a fat fast, um, about a week and a half ago. And I hadn't done it in probably years um, or or months at least for whatever reason. (laughs) And like you, was struck by just how much, how just good I felt and how easy it was. Just those little, that little spurt, I think I did three in the day. Um, It just, I probably did four. Um, I think I did two in the morning, one at lunch with really, really hot, hot water with the butter. And I would just be sitting here kind of sipping on it, whether I was at home or in my office. I just really enjoyed it. And it kind of renewed my affection for the practice. And I'll do it again. Yeah. I find just having that in the day makes it far easier. Don't Don't tell me I can't have anything. Right. I have some people that I've worked with where their A1C has started to go up on a carnivore diet and when they share this in fact i've even had a few that were not pre-diabetic before carnivore and then their doctor has to have the pre-diabetes talk Mm. with them Mm -hmm. okay and then someone will inevitably in the group when the share occurs they will chime in and say yes but dr ben bickman says that if we are getting healthier our blood cells live longer and it can actually cause an uptick, which I find fascinating. It is. Yeah. It's cool. But is that always what's at play here? If the A1C no, is going. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Th- th- what a wonderful question. So w- there are, there are likely countless um, possible um, explanations here. One is, is that what people have heard me describe before, which is that A1C is just as much a marker of red blood cell longevity as it is a marker of glucose. And I'm not I'm not being uh, crazy in saying that. It, it literally is a marker of how much glucose is binding to your red blood cells. Well, that's a process of time. And if you have a red blood cell that is just so robust because there's so much good iron and so much good fats in the membrane that it just is hard to kill, I mean, it just lives longer, then it's just more likely, statistically, it's just more probable that eventually there's going to be glucose that binds onto it. Okay. It's not like it kills the red blood cell. It okay. doesn't. It's just a marker of how much glucose is bound to your um, to your, your red blood cell. And again, if you have a red blood cell that lives a very long time, it's just more likely that glucose is going to bind it. In contrast, we can flip the scenario around. If someone's diet is so nutrient deficient, that they that their red blood cells are very fragile, mm. uh, then there's simply even if they have higher glucose levels, it takes time for the glucose to bind and glycosylate the hemoglobin, and so it's in that instance, the person who may actually have fasting glucose levels that are problematic may have an A1C that's not, oh. because it's the the glucose is only half of the equation. You yeah. need glucose and you need red blood cell. If you take either of these and push it up. The average has gone up, you know, it's kind of the combination of the two. And so if someone has normal glucose, but long lived red blood cells, it just is a bit bit of a false positive. Okay, cool. All right. I I do have, this is unusual, but I do have a group member who is quite metabolically healthy at this point. Thanks to carnivore, keto first, then carnivore, um, as is often the case. 
Blood pressure is now normal, normal A1C, low triglycerides, high HDL. Her ratio uh, is 0.8. It's like That's fantastic. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, mine stays at one or a little below. So right now hers is better than mine. And she even has a fasting insulin score right now, just below six, mm -hmm. which great. Yep. On paper, oh my gosh, she's she has prevented so many future illnesses by fixing these things. Yeah. But she is still obese and mm. has been about a hundred hundred and twenty pounds overweight. Um consistently she lost yeah. a little and has been stuck absolutely stuck all right with so many health um improvements she isn't mad about it but also she's frustrated yeah and i just thought let's just list some things that perhaps could be done next and of course i have already mentioned <laughs> take walks after dinner which she is doing yeah try to resistance train twice a week de-stress if you are really stressed i know a guy who's been carnivore for two years went through a very stressful whoo, stressful situation had his fasting insulin checked and it was back up to 19 oh my gosh and he yeah. has not had carbs and i know this guy he yeah. has yeah. not had carbs but he's not sleeping he is stressed fasting insulin is up all right so i have suggested that this woman get her hormones checked Mm -hmm. Obviously, her diet's in check. Um, I have heard that if there's a deep underlying infection or illness, like SIRS, mold toxicity, that it can elevate insulin even in the absence of the food that you're eating, carbs. Have you heard that? Is that true? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's let's start with that. Uh, so I don't know much about mold um, within, I would just want people to know that within the kind of rigorous scientific community, yeah. the effects of mold um, is very, very debated. Um, so there's really no clear consensus on what are the true ramifications of it. Some saying that there's no evidence for it at all. Some saying that it'll kill you from top to bottom yep. and each is citing their own sides. So it's very, very debated. And I don't really come down on any side of that, but there's no question if someone has an underlying autoimmune um, disease or they are inhaling something that's triggering an immune response um, uh, within a home that, you know, depending on if there's a fire, a fireplace, wood burning, and it's not vented well, um, cigarette smoke, even secondhand. Yes. Um, we published a paper on secondhand smoke, diesel exhaust particles. Okay. All of those promote insulin resistance. So there's very much a reason to scrutinize the air that you're breathing that this person or everyone, the air that we're all breathing. Yep. Um, clearly, hers is a body that is uh, has hyperplastic fat cells. And this is a whole other topic. And I'm sure I, you've probably heard me talk about this before. I'm, I bet others have too. But the the human body is capable of two types of fat gain. Now, you can have two guys and they're both gaining 10 pounds of fat a year. Mm -hmm. Um one guy is gaining it through a process called hypertrophy, where each individual fat cell starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the number of fat cells doesn't change. The other guy is getting fat through a process called hyperplasia, where his fat cells are all quite modest, but he just keeps reproducing them. That is a very uncommon way of getting fat. Wow. Most people get fat through hypertrophy, and that starts to cause insulin resistance, and it also starts to become a self-correcting problem. Because the fat cells, once they hypertrophy so much, they become insulin resistant to prevent further growth. And so they just sort of get there and cap out. This is how most people get fat. Most people can't get to 400 pounds mm. of fat, or even, even most people can't even get to 300 pounds of, of fat gain, right. um, let alone 500 or 600. Yeah. The people who can keep going and beyond that point are the people who get fat through hyperplasia. And paradoxically, they are surprisingly insulin sensitive. They'll have normal blood pressure. They'll have normal blood lipids. They'll have normal insulin, normal glucose. Metabolically, they're going to be fine because so much of metabolic health is a consequence of the size of the fat cell, not how much fat we have on our bodies. Oh. So now even still, as these two people are getting fat, you need both a sufficient insulin signal to tell the fat to store fat, okay. and you need sufficient calories to fuel that storage. Yes. And that then becomes the leverage points for turning things back down. 
that it needs to be a combination of reductions in insulin, at least first. Yeah, my thought on a weight loss journey is you got two steps you're going to take to get okay. things started. The first step should be, I'm going to lower my insulin through low carb, carb restriction, because that doesn't need to be calorie restricted. Because if my first step is I'm going to go low energy and low calorie all the way, you're going to have to cut fat a lot. You're still going to be eating carbs. And if your insulin is still high, you're going to be hungry. Because if you have higher insulin with lower energy, the total amount of energy in the blood is really low and the brain will sense that and the brain will make you hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. Okay. And so don't start with the low energy step. Keep that one in check. Start with the low insulin step. Really get your carbs in line. Focus on proteins and fats. Manage your macros to lower your insulin. Yes. That'll increase your metabolic rate. It'll start burning fat and wasting energy as ketones. Then when you get to a plateau and you say, I've gotten to a point now I want to go further. If the insulin is good now, now it's time to take the next step, which is the low energy step. Calories do matter, but now you are in a better position to burn fat, which is what you need to do if you're in a calorie um, deficit. If there's not enough energy coming in to fuel the body, you need to have enough of your own fuel to keep those fires going. And ideally, because you've had low insulin for a period of time, your body is capable of burning fat. And so now you can transition into that next phase. So in her body, she clearly is a person who has the adipocyte hyperplasia. Her genetics um, have enabled her fat cells to reproduce. Yes. She can still lose it, um, but but if her insulin is good, and it sounds like it is, that's a good yes. insulin level. And if she can measure her ketones and find that with any kind of modest, you know, 24 hour fast, she's in ketosis, but she would want to confirm that. Um, you do want to confirm that because ketones are the proof of fat burning because it, they are she, literal products. She barely ever gets above 0.5. It's usually... There's point. something There's something not right here then. She needs to go get a full hormone panel, make hormone sure she gets panel. her insulin measured at, at a minimum. Oh, she did. She already yes. does. Um, but then get thyroid hormone measured too. Okay. Um, does she have any history of autoimmune diseases? I don't know, but... I, I do encourage members who just they're doing it so they're carnivoring so hard, Ben, and they're not getting results. And at that point, I'm with you. Let's get that fasting insulin checked right away online. It's yeah. a $12, 50 cent test. This is a no brainer. Get it done. And then hormone check. My friend, Danny Conway, she she says, test, don't guess. Let's look. I say, look under the hood. Let's find out That's what's going right. on. Yeah. yeah. And take the SIRS vision test. Find out, is there potentially a reason for you to have um, the lab work done? That's yeah. a $15 yeah. vision test. And sometimes people will then go down that pathway. They'll either find out it was hormones. Some people it's helped to say, okay, track your calories for a few days. Find out, are you way under eating? Are you way overeating? Let's get a yeah. tiny deficit. Yep. Sometimes macros, we can adjust that. Yeah, this is, I hope, giving people some ideas of places to look because I know there are some very frustrated people who have done the biggest thing. And I just want to hug them and pat them on the back and say, you cut out the carbs. That's huge. What else can they, can we do? Yeah, well, yeah. So it's those first step, managing your macros, get your, get your insulin down, uh, get more insulin sensitive and help your body learn to burn its own fuel. And then that will result in some degree of loss. And then if a person, as I said, if they're not where they want to get, then the next step is the low energy step, which is, right. all right, it's time to start cutting the calories back. The best way to do that is fasting. That's why I wanted to hold that one back. It's yeah. because the, the fasting is, is, it does span both. But <clears throat> if a person starts to really fast frequently in the absence of getting their, ma their macros managed, I think they're setting themselves up to fail because then they're going to be really, really fighting hunger. And the hungrier you're getting, the more likely you are to turn fast into binge purge cycles. Yep. Um, so let the fasting kind of be withheld a little bit. Manage your macros. That's the first step. Okay. Learn to burn fat. Then start to rely on that fat more through fasts and other kind of mild forms of calorie restriction. If that hasn't gotten to the new plateau, then there is reason I would say to look at, um, try to find some other explanation because you're doing everything right. Yeah. 
I agree. And I tell folks, if I knew of anything else, we would tell, would we not tell them right now? Ben? Oh, yeah. We'd be like, of course. this is it. This is what we want you to try. But the human body, unfortunately and fortunately, we are all so varied. Yeah. And and even what one other person has found, um, it doesn't necessarily work for another. Yeah, that's true. I've got some people right now who are doing amazing things, such great changes. They finally feel energetic and they're losing some weight and they're eating lots of sardines. Mm. <laughs> they're loving sardines. Well, there are some benefits for one. You want oh, to know sure. if you're hungry or not, you'll oh, find yeah. out. With no the kidding. sardines, for example, in the evenings, if you say, "Oh my gosh, I can't eat after dinner," sometimes I'll do the same thing to myself. I'll say, "No eating after dinner unless it's a can of sardines." Yeah, or a hard-boiled egg. Yep, yeah, That's good right. point. Yep. Yeah, then you'll know. Are That's you a true hunger check. I totally agree. Yeah, but it's that exact same solution for somebody where it's working beautifully for somebody with a histamine issue. Can you imagine they're eating sardines all day? Somebody's. No. No, it's not going to work. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. I've kept you a long time. And I'm. Well, I had some long answers. So I can. Right. I had uh, some tough questions. And <laughs> I thank you for showing up to help answer them. I didn't even come up with other questions. There were some of my group members who said, Love it. Please ask him this. One one lady begged me. She's the one that we just discussed, where she's yeah. so metabolically healthy. Why am I not losing? You would encourage well, there is a genetic component. Um, yeah. Like she may have family genetics where the enzyme lipoprotein lipase, which which is responsible for pulling fat from the blood and putting it in fats in whatever cell where it is, she may have higher levels of LPL lipoprotein lipase expressed in her adipose tissue than other people do. It's something that could be as kind of simple, but you know perhaps uncommon as that. Some bodies just are determined to store fat, much to, of course, the individual's frustration, which I can only imagine. I know, me too. Should she just keep still doing these amazing things? Yeah, well, if for the reason you mentioned, um, which is that these have been shown to reduce cr risk of chronic disease. Yeah. And if, and if uh, I mean, you know, there are worse things than having, easy for me to say, so I don't mean I for this to sound cheeky. There are worse things than having too much fat mass, like, having diabetes in your limbs rotting, having heart disease and not being able to walk, mm -hmm. um, having dementia um, because of the insulin resistance of the brain and not being able to remember what you're doing. Yes. Um, so I would say that the improvements in the cardiometabolic risk factors that you mentioned, it shows that this is something that is working, just maybe not working in all the ways we would want. And of course, I have hope that it will start to eventually work, that it might just be slower if she's gotten these other improvements. I think that yeah. might be the most powerful thing I've heard today. It's not just just about the fat. It's about our health and long-term health too. All right, thank you. I respect you and your work so much. I will link to much of it below and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you. See ya.